All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming out so early on the second day of a conference. That's no easy task, so I really appreciate it. I notice everyone is a little bit sleepy, so we're going to do something to wake up just a little bit and so I can kind of get a feel of the room. So we're going to do something called hands up and hands down. So hands up is if you agree 100%. Wiggle your hands, wiggle your hands. And hands down is if you 100% disagree with whatever I'm going to say to you. So here, I understand public procurement and what it is. Hands up if you completely, wow, <laughs> look at this group, it's amazing. You can be in the middle. You can be in the middle, so you can be anywhere between here and there, so totally agree. Looks like a lot of people know a lot about procurement. How about this? My government uses my money well. Hands up or hands down? Oh, that's sad. <laughs> okay, what about this? There is a lot of corruption in my country. Hands up or hands down? There is a lot of corruption in my country. Middle. Middle to high. Good. Um, so it seems like a lot of people already know about open contracting and public procurement, which is great. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've learned over the last two years working as our monitoring evaluation and research lead at Open Contracting Partnership. Um, so when we talk about public contracting, what we're really talking about is how government spends your money. So that's on everything from bridges and schools to roads and airports. It really touches every single aspect of your day. So we often talk about very nebulous terms like value for money and market opportunity, but I want us really to think as we're going through this um, exercise, which is not presenting, so I don't know if we can change it. Um, as we're going through this exercise about, these are things that really affect us on a day-to-day -day level. They're things that touch us every single day. Um, it's not some nebulous thing that's out in the ether. It's really uh, the goods and services that our government provides for us every single day. All right. Thank you so much. Perfect. So with that, I'm going to start with the takeaways. Um, so there's a lot of details in this presentation, uh, but I want you to just come away with three things from what I'm talking about. The first is that when we're able to unite data, civic tech, and civil society, and public participation, we can track how our government spends our money and really change the way that spending works. Um, the second is that we do see results of open contracting, both qualitative and quantitative, from a lot of places. And the three places I'll talk about today are Colombia, Paraguay, and Ukraine. And it's not work that's easy. Um, there are a lot of challenges, and some of the main challenges that we've seen over the last two years are identifying use cases or how exactly you're going to use open contracting in your community. Promoting cultural shifts within organizations is really tough, and data quality remains a challenge. Um, so why is open contracting important to begin with? Um, we all know that it has to do with the goods and services we touch, but what kind of scale are we talking about here? So public procurement is a nine and a half trillion dollar a year enterprise. We spend nine and a half trillion dollars a year globally on public contracting. So that's about 15% of our global GDP is spent on contracting. And right now, um, we're estimated to lose about 20 to 25% of that budget just to corruption alone not even just misuse of funds, just corruption, 20 to 25% of our spending on public procurement. So sit with that number for a second. Think about what we can do in our communities with 25% more of $9.5 trillion, and you'll really see the value of opening up this information and getting citizen voices into how government is spending. So open contracting has kind of two main tenements. It's about opening up information and data about public procurement, and it's also about defending the rights of citizens um, and the private sector to have a voice in how government spends. So how do we do this? And you'll see throughout the presentation, there are some links up here in blue. Um, so the presentations will be sent out, and there's a lot more information in those links, which I won't cover today. But if you're interested later, that's where all of the extra information is. Um, so there are a couple of different ways that we work that are probably most relevant to this group. Um, so the first is that we work in a cross-sectoral way, which means that we want governments talking to civil society, private sector, journalists, academia, um, in addition to other stakeholder groups, to make sure that everyone has a voice in how the money is spent and how data are opened up. So that means uh, a high level of CSO and civic tech participation in this process. On the technical front, we maintain an open contracting data standard, um, and so we provide technical support to countries who want to turn their maybe closed data or semi-open data into a totally open international format, and we also provide tools for analyzing those data. Um, so a big part of the work that we do then is working both in governments and then with uh, people outside of government to build up their capacity and their data literacy from making use of that data. 
The main goal really of opening up data isn't just transparency for transparency's sake, it's making sure that whatever is published is actually used and it's really useful for people who wanna do analyses about how their government is spending. So we do work with data use. Um, my job particularly is focused on monitoring and evaluation. So we're a very small team. We're 12 people right now, but we have actually two people that are dedicating most of their time just to monitoring our results and knowing if what we're doing is effective. And um, a couple of different aspects of that are impact analyses and then global research uh, that we do in partnership with other organizations. So I'm gonna talk about three different cases today. And again, I don't wanna focus just on the big numbers here. I wanna focus on the human aspect of it because open contracting isn't just about data. Data is a big part of it, but it's really about human stories. Um, so I wanna talk about the case of Colombia. And if anyone knows Bogota, it's a city with extremely high poverty levels. So a lot of children eat their main meal at schools every single day. Um, but with about 700 schools in the area and a daily population of about 9 million in Bogota and one of the worst traffic congestion problems in the world, the logistics of getting that food to the schools, it's really, really difficult. Um, and so for a number of reasons, uh, the, about 18% of the contracts for school meals were provided via uh, sole sourcing, which essentially means that the government picked a provider for those school meals, they didn't have any competition for that contract, and the providers named their price and the meals went into the schools. And you can see why that's a problem, where there's no competition, prices are going to be driven up, it's not fair contracting processes. And as a result of that, and the corruption that runs really rampant in Colombia, we saw, for example, chicken prices at about four times the market value, and last year alone, there were 30 million meals that weren't delivered to schools. So to put that on a human aspect, that's 30, 30 million times that a child in Bogota wasn't able to eat lunch because of either ineffective or corrupt procurement practices. So this really does have an impact on our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so what did we do for solving this problem? We worked across sectors, but particularly with Com Colombia Compra Eficiente, who's the main procurement agency in Colombia, um, political advocacy to get open contracting on the agenda user needs workshops to understand what the different types of needs were across each sector and to be able to open up data that they would need to do their work better. Um, there was a large amount of technical work of getting the Colombian data into the international uh, format and a bit more friendly for the end user. Later, we did private sector consultations to know why some of the main food companies in Colombia weren't participating in the public procurement market. Um, and what we found out there is that firms were worried about a couple of different things. They were worried about corruption, uh, and they didn't want to have to deal with the corruption that exists in Colombia public procurement. They didn't know how they would handle the volume of meals, um, so they were concerned about volume, and also about the bureaucracy that public procurement entails. Um, so one thing we were able to push was for the establishment of framework agreements, which is kind of a technical procurement term, but it essentially provided an extra level of security for firms who wanted to enter into public procurement for the first time, and we were able to diversify the market of suppliers for these school meals. Um, also, data use events. Most recently, we had an event for Open Data Day in Columbia where we had um, actors from across society, but really mostly from civil society come in and use the data uh, around school meals to find innovative solutions to getting better quality meals into schools. So what are some of the outcomes of this? First, we saw better dialogue between the government, who's the publisher of that data, and then all of the end users across the uh, public sector, sorry, the private sector, civil society, academia, et cetera. Better quality data, so there's more data now and it's a lot easier to use. The first time participation of recognized companies, so we have more firms that are competing in the same market. And Colombia Compra Eficiente actually formed a business consortium of about 347 partners just to monitor the quantity and the quality of these school meals, which is really great. And so what are the results that we've seen in the long term of this? The first is that Colombia Compra Eficiente, thanks to their open data, was able to expose a price fixing scheme that was increasing prices by about 45%. Um, so on the right, we see a table that talks about the prices of fruits. So CCE is the buying agency in Colombia, and then there are the providers, and these were the prices that were being quoted. So um, for example, for one banana, the price quoted was about 141 pesos, which is about five cents, and the providers were asking for 300, so a double in the price. We see the same for um, red apples, for mangoes, and for pears as well. And thanks to exposing this price fixing scheme, um, they've seen savings of about 10 to 15% on school meals, which means cheaper meals and more meals for kids. Um, and so now the $130 million that's spent annually on a public, uh, public school meals is now allocated to 
54 companies instead of just 12. So there's a lot more diversity in the market, which is great for businesses, especially small businesses. And it's also great for the kids who get the meals. We get um, better meals for less money, and that's amazing. And 14 of those firms are actually new first time uh, firms that are entering into the market. And as a result of that, we now see about 700,000 quality meals served daily in Bogota, which is really exciting progress. So I wanna take it down one more notch um, just to look at what open contracting actually looks like when we're at the implementation level. So I've talked about the results and everything seems great, but what are the activities that lead up to that? So I'm just gonna give an example for every case I talk about. Um, one thing we did in Columbia was this user needs assessment, uh, which is actually very similar to what Joyce had mentioned about the data user story activity. So essentially getting stakeholders from across uh, different sectors to talk openly about what their realities are, what their data needs are, and what kind of uh, things they were trying to achieve. So what we were able to do was match up the intended impacts that they wanted to see with concrete data fields that they would need to be able to meet those, uh, meet those goals. And then from there, we mapped out all of those data needs to what's already available in the Colombia Compreficiente portal and saw where the data gaps are. Then we took a step back as our organization, had conversations with the technical teams at Columbia Compra to make sure that those data were prioritized for publication. So Paraguay is actually quite a similar case uh, to Colombia in that the thing, the, the main scandal that really put uh, open contracting on the forefront had to do with schools. So I want you to take a look at this and imagine this is filled with mate. Mate is a type of tea that's very, very popular in a lot of South American countries. Every day, average tea. Does anyone drink mate? How much would you pay for one liter of mate? Shout it out. How much would you pay for this? Dollar. Dollar? About a dollar? <laughs> All right. This was costing in Paraguay last year $14. Governments were spending $14 on one liter of mate. And in a country where in the capital, the average salary is $356, this was a gross misuse of funds and everyone knew it. There, was, um, there were a lot of other types of issues going on with contracting around the time, but that was really the story that broke through and people got upset and they wanted to do something about it. There was actually a really big open data movement in Paraguay before this. There was an active civil society who knew a lot about the theories of open data, but didn't necessarily know how to use data. And that's where our data literacy training came in. So we worked on capacity development both within government and then with civil society to make sure that the data published in the portal uh, by the uh, Paraguayan Procurement Authority, the DNCP, were actually used. Um, we also had technical consultations across sectors to understand what their needs were and what kind of um, portal updates or visualizations they would need to be able to do their work better. And we held a series of hackathons. Um, and as a result of all of this, Paraguay was able to make some changes to its portal, including some um, revisions to the, the way they were displaying infographics and interactive graphs on their website, which made it a lot easier to use, a lot more friendly. They installed a bulk download feature, um, an API output, which is really helpful for anyone who wants to do mass data analysis. What were the outcomes of this? Um, first, we saw that the portal visits went up by about a third. More citizens were participating in the procurement conversation. And there was an increase in the number of suppliers in Paraguay, with 21,000 now registered. And in a country where the population is only 6.5 million, that's a really significant amount of suppliers in the system. So um, to give a concrete example of kind of what this looks like in the, oh, sorry. Let's talk first about results. Uh, so the long-term results. So this resulted in an increase uh, in savings to about 1.4%, which again, for a small country with a small GDP is really significant. Um, and amendments on all contracts, which are a prime source of corruption in a lot of countries, uh, dropped from 19% of all contracts to 3% of all contracts. So um, let me give kind of a concrete example of what this looks like in the field. So this is an analysis that's done by Reacción or Reaction, which is a leading civil society group in Paraguay. And what they looked at was the spending at different schools. So they wanted to see if the schools that were receiving the most public funds were actually the ones that were most in need. And the results were really interesting. So they found that half of the schools that had the most spending weren't even on land that pertained to the Ministry of Education. So they shouldn't have had any public spending to begin with. So that was a clear red flag. Later, they found that only one school that was actually the most in need was receiving the most money. And to give kind of a technical view of why this is important, why it's important to open up data, um, the analysis that was done two years ago required about $2,600 and eight months of work. But after the open data uh, movement in Paraguay that opened up the contracting data, 
it, they only needed about $200 and two weeks of work to be able to complete the exact same analysis. Um, so to move on to Ukraine, our final example, this one is a little more geared towards the private sector, which doesn't necessarily speak as much to this room, but private sector is a really big part of open contracting. Um, so before the 2014 revolution, Ukraine was one of the most corrupt countries on earth. Uh, about 20% of public spending was being lost just to corruption. Um, and so to give a couple examples of what that looked like, there were benches that were being constructed in the metros that were uh, costing about the same as the average Ukrainian car. So it was just shocking the amount of misspending and mismanagement of funds in this country. Um, so a very dedicated group of unpaid volunteers started up a movement called Prozoro, which means transparency in Ukrainian. Uh, and they worked hard to make sure that all of the public contracts were displayed on one portal in one site in a downloadable, easy to use format. And the pilot of this was actually so successful that two years later in 2016, the Ukrainian parliament voted to make all contracts mandatory to be published on the Prozoro website, which is now the main portal for um, any public contracting in Ukraine. So the portal has a couple of different features. The first is a business intelligence tool for analyzing tender data, which is really useful for first time bidders and SMEs who want to get into the market and want to know what a good tender looks like so they can win contracts with government. There is also a complaint mechanisms for bidders, um, which is hosted on a separate portal, which is called Duzoro, which is a feedback portal. And it essentially allows anyone within a contracting process, so that could be a member of the public or a firm, to submit a complaint about how a public contract is run if they see a sign of corruption. Um, to make it as user-friendly as possible, the Prozoro team also developed an informational portal with training guides about how to use and analyze the data. Uh, and so in total, all of this results in a monitoring platform for buyers and sellers to rate their experiences and to be able to submit complaints. So the sh very short-term outcomes of this were that the Prozoro inquiries, the Google inquiries, went from 680 to 191,000 in just one year. Um, as of today, there are 15,000 buyers and 47,000 suppliers registered in the system. And public bodies and state-owned enterprises are able to monitor procurement and the feedback on tenders um, in one central place that's very easy to use. So what are the results? So we have the Prozoro platform, which is where the contracts and um, the final any amendments are listed, and then the Duozoro platform, which is the feedback mechanism. Um, so in the Prozoro platform, the average number of suppliers per contracting agency went up from nine and a half to 11 and a half, essentially. So that would mean, for example, that the Ministry of Education used to have an average of nine suppliers, and now they have an average of 11, which is really great progress, and it shows a diversification of that market. Um, and interestingly, about 80% of those are now SMEs, which is great for, for small business growth in Ukraine. Um, on a user survey, 72% said Prozoro reduces corruption in Ukraine, and about 80% said that procurement has improved with Prozoro. On the Duzoro side of things, um, the, the kind of complaints platform, uh, users flagged 5,000 tenders just in the first six months. Of those, 50% 50 uh, were resolved satisfactorily, and as a result of that 50%, 200 tenders were revised. 22 criminal charges were pressed and 79 sanctions were issued. So the public is very active in monitoring public procurement. They are now empowered to submit complaints and say when something seems off. Um, so a concrete activity related to this Ukrainian work is the development of a monitoring and evaluation framework. So as our organization, we have frameworks in a couple of different countries and Ukraine is our most developed one. Um, we had our baselines taken in 2015 and we do annual progress reports to track how things are going. And among the indicators which were decided upon based on consultations, not only with the public sector, but also private sector and CSOs, um, we have information around policy changes, data quality, engagement and feedback. So that would be things like feedback loops or how citizens are engaging with government. And the hard results of business opportunities, so that would be market opportunity, value for money, and integrity within the country. So I'm going to leave it there. There's a lot of extra information I can go into, and I'm happy to discuss at any point today. Um, I want to leave with a couple of things. This is not easy work. It's really satisfying work um, because it does touch every aspect of what we use in terms of public services every day, but it's tough. Um, and a couple of the really difficult things that we battle are identifying the use case past transparency for transparency. So a lot of governments that come to us that want help publishing their data want it do it because it's international recognition or they're trying to comply with some kind of commitment that they've made, but they don't really think past that. 
and as a result, the data usually don't tend to be the best quality. Um, it's not necessarily an invalid use case to want to do transparency for transparency's sake, but it definitely doesn't lead to the most successful implementations. Um, promoting a culture of cooperation and monitoring within organizations is tough. We always have champions in our organizations and the governments that we work with who are fighting the good fight, but there are a lot of institutional barriers that are pressing back against those champions at all times. Um, and at an organizational level, it's really hard to um, get them on board with the idea of monitoring the results and having uh, staff members take accountability for what they do. The last challenge is data quality and completeness. Um, so this is in some ways related to identifying the use case and not really having a clear idea of why we're doing open contracting. It's also related to um, lack of technical capacity at a lot of these organizations and government agencies. Um, is that they just really don't know what to do with the data, which means that the data don't tend to be the best quality, or they're not updated regularly, or they're not in a format that's really useful for the end user. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. I just want you to remember that public recruitment touches every aspect of life. Um, if you took a train in to the conference center this morning, if you took a car and you went along a public road, that's public contracting in action right there. So it's really our responsibility as members of this community to demand data and to be more proactive in asking for publications, pushing our governments for publication of more and better procurement data. And that's it.